United States Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs, Examination of U.S. Secret, Service Planning and Security Failures Related to the July 13, 2024 Assassination Attempt, Interim Joint Report, HSDAC and Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations Bipartisan Staff Report, September 2024. First Introduction. On July 13, 2024, Thomas Matthew Crooks bought 50 rounds of ammunition on his way to Butler, Pennsylvania drove to former President Donald Trump's campaign rally at the Butler Farm Show grounds and climbed onto the roof of the American Glass Research, AJAR, building less than 200 yards away from where the former president was speaking, where at 6. 11 p.m., he fired eight rounds from an AR-15 semi-automatic rifle, killing one person and injuring three others, including the former president. That day, he was able to fly a drone 200 yards from the site, use a rangefinder capable of gauging the distance to the former president less than an hour before he began speaking, and bring two explosive devices within proximity of the site of the rally. The United States Secret Service's USSS, planning, communications, intelligence sharing, and related security failures in advance of and during July 13th, directly contributed to Crook's ability to carry out the assassination attempt and kill and injure people in Butler, Pennsylvania that day. On July 30, 2024, Ronald L. Rowe Jr., the acting director of the USSS, testified in a joint hearing before the Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee, HSGA Seek, and Judiciary Committee, that the attempted assassination was a failure on multiple levels. Acting Director Rowe testified before the committees that he has since initiated several reforms to address clear deficiencies in how USSS provides security for its protectees. During the July 30 hearing, Acting Director Rowe acknowledged USSS responsibility for protecting former President Trump. In a series of transcribed interviews conducted by HSGAC and the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, key USSS personnel responsible for planning, coordinating, communicating and securing the Butler PA rally on July 13th declined to acknowledge individual areas of responsibility for planning or security as having contributed to the failure to prevent the shooting that day, even when as an agency. The USSS has acknowledged ultimate responsibility for the failure to prevent the former President of the United States from being shot. At the direction of U.S. Senators Gary Peters and Rand Paul, Chairman and Ranking Member of HSGAC, and Senators Richard Blumenthal and Ron Johnson, Chairman and Ranking Member of the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations the Committee, Majority and Minority Committee staff are conducting a bipartisan investigation of planning and security failures that contributed to the attempted assassination on July 13, 2024. This interim report details the information the committee has learned to date, as well as the committee's preliminary findings. The committee finds that USSS failures in planning, communications, security, and allocation of resources for the July 13, 2024 Butler rally were foreseeable, preventable, and directly related to the events resulting in the assassination attempt that day. The committee also finds that siloed communications and coordination problems between federal, state, and local law enforcement officials remain unaddressed and were a contributing factor to the failures at the July 13th Butler rally. On September 15, 2024, a suspect was taken into custody in West Palm Beach, Florida, after being identified by USSS hiding in a tree line with a semi-automatic rifle and a scope approximately 300 to 500 yards from where former President Trump was playing golf at Trump International Golf Club. On September 16, the Department of Justice DOJ, Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, USSS, and Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office held a press conference to provide an update on the investigation. On September 16, the suspect was charged with possession of a firearm and ammunition by a convicted felon, among other charges. According to the complaint, the suspect's mobile phone was in the vicinity of the area, along the tree line, for approximately 12 hours prior to the incident. The FBI has said it is investigating the incident as an apparent assassination attempt. The committee has requested briefings from the USSS and the FBI. The committee will be pursuing additional information from the USSS, FBI, and other relevant federal agencies as the committee continues its investigation. Committee Actions to Date On July 15, 2024, Chairman Peters and Ranking Member Paul announced their investigation into the assassination attempt on former President Trump and called for a briefing and public hearing within 15 days. On July 24 and 25, 2024, Chairman Peters and Blumenthal and Ranking Members Paul and Johnson sent 10 letters requesting documents and information to the USSS, FBI, Department of Homeland Security DHS's Office of Intelligence and Analysis, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives ATF, Beaver County District Attorney, Butler County District Attorney, Butler County Sheriff, Butler Township Police Department, Pennsylvania State Police's PSP, 
and Clareton Sportsman's Club, as well as a letter requesting voluntary transcribed interviews with USSS individuals responsible for planning and security on July 13th zero. On July 25th, 2024, Acting USSS Director Rowe and FBI National Security Branch Executive Assistant Director Wells provided a closed-door unclassified briefing for HSGAC and Judiciary Committee members. And on July 30, 2024, Acting Director Rowe and FBI Deputy Director Paul Abate testified at a joint public hearing before the Senate HSGAC and Judiciary Committees. On August 14, 2024, the committee wrote DHS Secretary Mayorkas and FBI Director Ray seeking additional information about the July 12, 2024 arrest of Asif Merchant for allegedly orchestrating a plot to assassinate U.S. government officials and politicians and any information related to security decisions made by the USSS in advance of July 13.16. As part of its bipartisan investigation, committee staff traveled to Butler, Pennsylvania on July 26 to conduct a site visit walkthrough of the Butler Farm Show and AGR building and receive briefings from local law enforcement officials. Specifically, Committee staff spoke with law enforcement officials from Butler and Beaver County's Emergency Services Units ESSs that provided support to USSS on July 13, including the local snipers posted in the AGR building that day. During the visit, committee staff examined the roof and interior of the AGR building with those officials. The committee has also interviewed four local law enforcement officers who provided support on July 13, three local snipers and one quick response force operator, the president of the Clareton Sportsman's Club, and two rally attendees. The committee has also examined state and local operational plans and other related information provided by PSP, Butler County ESU, and Beaver County ESU, reviewed local radio communications on July 13, provided by Butler County Emergency Services, and reviewed body-worn camera footage provided by Butler Township Police Department. The committee has also reviewed transcripts and audio recordings of several PSP interviews of state and local law enforcement officials who helped provide support on July 13. On August 13, 2024, the committee began a series of transcribed interviews with USSS personnel. To date, committee staff have examined over two, 800 pages of documents provided by USSS and conducted 12 transcribed interviews with USSS personnel responsible for the planning and security in Butler, Pennsylvania, on July 13, 2024. As discussed at the conclusion of this interim report, key requests to FBI, DHS, ATF and USSS remain outstanding. The majority of documents provided by the USSS and DHS are heavily redacted. This has unnecessarily hindered the committee's ability to carry out its constitutional authority to investigate and acquire information necessary to identify needed reforms. These overly burdensome redactions, including of communications related to the same individuals who the committee interviewed, only serve to delay the committee's ability to conduct these interviews and carry out its investigation efficiently and effectively. Despite these impediments, the committee recognized the need to conduct transcribed interviews with USSS personnel as soon as possible before memories faded. In addition, as detailed in the report below, several USSS individuals responsible for planning and security for the July 13 rally provided contradictory or incomplete information, some of which ran counter to responses from state and local law enforcement officials and even other USSS personnel. This interim report highlights preliminary findings based on the committee's transcribed interviews and the limited document productions it has received to date. These preliminary failures and findings consider the actions of the USSS in the period leading up to the July 13 assassination attempt. They do not consider the extent to which other agencies or individuals may have contributed to these events, if at all. The committee is choosing to present these preliminary findings while its investigation remains ongoing to ensure that the public has the most accurate and up-to-date information. The committee will continue to pursue all information it deems necessary to carry out its oversight responsibilities and will, if necessary, take steps to ensure that it obtains the information it is seeking. Key Failures 1. USSS failed to clearly define responsibilities for planning and security at the July 13 rally. USSS personnel, responsible for planning in advance of the July 13 rally, denied that they were individually responsible for planning or security failures and deflected blame. USSS advance agents told the committee that planning and security decisions were made jointly, with no specific individual responsible for approval. 2. USSS failed to ensure the AGR building was effectively covered. USSS identified the AGR building as a concern due to the line of sight from the roof to the stage, but did not take steps to ensure sufficient security measures were in place. USSS knew that local snipers planned to set up inside the AGR building, and USSS did not express objections or concerns about that placement. USSS personnel, including the USSS counter-sniper team leader, did not enter the AGR building or go on the roof prior to the shooting. One USSS counter-sniper team, 
whose responsibility included scanning the area around the AGR building for threats, had an obstructed view of the AGR roof. 3. USSS failed to effectively coordinate with state and local law enforcement. USSS did not give state or local partners specific instructions for covering the AGR building, including the positioning of local snipers. USSS did not adequately consider state and local law enforcement operational plans. Communications at the July 13th rally were siloed, and USSS did not ensure it could share information with local law enforcement partners in real time. 4. USSS failed to provide resources for the July 13 rally that could have enhanced security. USSS denied specific requests for additional counter unmanned aircraft systems CUASA's capabilities in a counter assault. Team Liaison A USSS counter surveillance unit, which could have helped patrol the outer perimeter that included the AGR building, was not requested by USSS advance. Agents 5. USSS failed to communicate information about the suspicious person to key personnel and failed to take action to ensure the safety of former President Trump. At approximately 5.45 p.m., USSS personnel were notified that local law enforcement observed a suspicious person with a rangefinder near the AGR building. By 5.52 p.m., at least eight USSS personnel had been informed. Approximately two minutes before shots were fired, the USSS security room, located on the rally grounds, was told that there was an individual on the roof of the AGR building. Shortly before shots were fired, a USSS counter-sniper observed local officers running towards the AGR building with guns drawn. Second Findings and Recommendations Findings As detailed below and throughout this report, the committee has identified several key findings as part of its ongoing investigation. 1. USSS personnel were notified of a suspicious person with a rangefinder around the AGR building approximately 27 minutes before the shooting. The report of a suspicious person with a rangefinder near the AGR building was relayed to the USSS security room at approximately 5.44 p.m. and to the USSS counter-sniper team leader at 5.45 p.m. Shortly after, USSS personnel, including a counter-sniper response agent, engaged in an on-the-ground effort to locate the individual. However, the USSS lead advance agent, site agent, and site counterpart all told the committee they did not receive this information and therefore did not know local law enforcement had identified a suspicious person with a rangefinder and that those local officers later lost track of this individual until after shots were fired. 2. USSS was notified about an individual on the AGR roof approximately two minutes before crooks fired from the AGR roof. Three minutes before shots were fired, a local law enforcement officer sent out a radio alert that there was an individual on the AGR roof. This Information was passed at the USSS security room approximately two minutes before Crooks fired. Approximately 22 seconds before Crooks fired, a local officer sent out a radio alert that the individual on the AGR roof was armed, but that was not relayed to key USSS personnel that the committee spoke with. 3. Shortly before shots were fired, a USSS counter sniper saw local law enforcement running toward the AGR building with their guns drawn, but he did not alert former President Trump's protective detail to remove him from the stage. The USSS counter-sniper told the committee that, while seeing officers with their guns drawn elevated the threat level, the thought to notify someone to get Trump off the stage did not cross his mind. 4. USSS counter-snipers, including the one who shot and killed Crooks, were sent to the rally in response to credible intelligence of a threat. The July 13th rally was the first time a USSS counter-sniper team was assigned to a protectee, other than the president, vice president, or a presidential candidate who had been formally nominated by his or her party. USSS provided the counter-snipers in response to credible intelligence of a threat. However, FBI has said that Crooks was not known to the FBI prior to the assassination attempt. According to the USSS Assistant Director of the Office of Protective Operations, a decision to assign counter-snipers to former President Trump's events occurred sometime in the first week of July. Of the USSS personnel interviewed by the committee, Nearly all including the intelligence advance agent and the special agent in charge SIC of the Pittsburgh field office, said they were unaware of any credible intelligence of a threat. 5. USSS advance agents for the July 13th rally denied individual responsibility for planning or security failures, deflected blame, and could not identify who had final decision authority for the rally. USSS planning and execution of security measures for the July 13th rally appears to have lacked a clear chain of command. USSS advance agents told the committee that planning and security decisions were collaborative and could not agree on who at USSS was responsible for final approval or decisions. USSS advance agents, interviewed by the committee, could not identify who was responsible for determining the security perimeter for the July 13th rally. 6. Local law enforcement raised concern about the security coverage of the AGR building. A member of Butler ESU told the committee 
that he notified USSS advance agents during a walkthrough on Thursday, July 11, that local law enforcement did not have the manpower to lock down the AGR building. USSS advance agents, interviewed by the committee, gave conflicting accounts and told the committee that state and local law enforcement were responsible for covering the AGR building because it was in the outer perimeter. Prior to the July 13 rally, the USSS lead advance agent, counter sniper team leader, and site counterpart did not go into the AGR building. None of the USSS advance agents shared planning documents with state or local law enforcement or requested state or local operational plans, and those plans reveal no post standards or patrol assigned to cover the AGR building or roof. 7. USSS advance personnel identified multiple line of sight concerns at the Butler Farm showgrounds, including the AGR building. USSS advance personnel proposed positioning large trucks or heavy equipment in the area between the stage and nearby buildings to mitigate line of sight concerns. USSS told the committee they relied on multiple measures, including USSS counter sniper teams and bleachers, to mitigate lines off site. USSS ultimately did not use the trucks or heavy equipment to mitigate line of sight concerns from the AGR building. A USSS counter-sniper in the Hercules II position told the committee he believed the mitigations were sufficient, and the USSS site counterpart told the committee she believed they had a good security plan for the July 13 rally. 8. There were two separate communication centers at the July 13 rally, one run by USSS and one by local law enforcement. The posts were anywhere from 120 to 300 yards apart from each other, and the primary means of communication between the posts was by cell phone. Local law enforcement and USSS operated on separate radio channels. All of the local channels were recorded on July 13, but USSS radio transmissions were not. 9. Crooks was in the USSS counter sniper sites for mere seconds before he fired at Crooks. The USSS partner of the USSS counter sniper who shot Crooks told the committee he observed that mere seconds after his partner identified Crooks in his sights, the USSS counter sniper fired at Crooks. USSS countersnipers confirmed to the committee that they did not require permission before they fired. 10. USSS advance agents requested additional resources that would have been helpful, but those assets were denied. The USSS CUAS operator told the committee he requested additional CCUAS equipment and personnel in the days before the rally. However, these requests were denied, at times without explanation. The USSS lead advance agent told the committee, Former President Trump's USSS detail requested counter-assault team liaisons to help coordinate tactical assets in advance of the July 13 rally, but USSS denied this request. The USSS site agent and the site counterpart told the committee that a counter-surveillance unit would have been helpful. But this asset is typically not provided for a former president, and USSS advance agents did not request a counter-surveillance unit for the July 13 rally. 11. USSS CUA system experienced technical problems and was inoperable until 4.33 p.m. after Crooks flew his drone near the rally site. With no backup system, the USSS agent responsible for overseeing the CUA's capabilities at the JG July 13 rally called a toll-free tech support hotline to start troubleshooting with the company, which took several hours. That agent had only three months of experience working with that equipment and lacked knowledge about it. 12. Several USSS officials reported experiencing technical problems with their radios at the rally and told the committee such problems are common for USSS. A USSS Hercules 1 counter sniper was offered a local radio on July 13th but said he did not have time to pick it up because he was occupied fixing technical problems with his USSS radio. In addition, at the Pittsburgh airport before the motorcade left for the rally, the USSS SIC of the Pittsburgh field office gave the lead advance agent his radio because the lead advance agent's radio was not working. As a result, the SIC did not have a working radio on him during his entire time at the July 13 rally. While he did not hold a post or a sector and was not part of any protective formation, he did claim that he was there to act more in a liaison capacity. However, he did not have any means to communicate on the radio with his USSS. Counterparts. Recommendations. 1. Planning and coordination. Congress should require USSS to identify defined roles and responsibilities for USSS personnel responsible for advanced planning of any protective event. For all protective events, USSS should improve coordination and specify roles and responsibilities between and among federal, state, and local law enforcement partners. USSS policies and protocols should require advanced planning leads to request and review state and local operational plans in advance of any protective event to ensure a shared understanding of security responsibilities and vulnerabilities, as well as other critical planning and security components. Two. Responsibility. In advance of each protective event, 
USSS should designate a single individual responsible for approving all plans, including the responsibility for approving security perimeters. 3. Communications, DHS and USSS should ensure communications plans between federal, state and local law enforcement agencies and first responders are properly executed, and should ensure records retention capabilities. Congress should require that USSS record its radio transmissions at all protective events. Congress should require DHS and USSS to evaluate the steps it needs to take to ensure communications plans with state and local. Partners are fully executed when conducting law enforcement and or first response activities at a given location. Congress should require that DHS and USSS report to Congress any steps taken to remedy past failures to execute communications plans and to ensure compliance with those plans in the future. 4. Intelligence. USSS should consider sending additional assets, including counter snipers, to all future outdoor protective events as it evaluates intelligence and threats against protectees. USSS should also ensure that the appropriate agents working protective events are informed of relevant intelligence and threats against protectees. 5. Resources. Congress should evaluate USSS budget and resources. Security requirements should be determined depending on various threat levels, ranging from less severe threat environments to the highest level of security at national special security events. Congress should require that USSS allocate assets and resources based on the threat level, not the position or title of the protectee. Third, USSS planning and security failures for July 13, 2024 rally. On July 3, 2024, USSS began assigning key personnel responsible for planning and coordinating security for former President Trump's travel to Pittsburgh and Camp Pennsylvania rally on July 13 in Butler, PA. In interviews with the committee, USSS agents responsible for leading and coordinating the advance planning for the July 13 rally provided contradictory, opaque, or non-responsive information about who was responsible for key components of the planning and security. In response to questions by the committee regarding responsibility for key planning decisions, the senior special agent who served as the lead advance agent for the July 13th rally stated, I don't approve anything. I clearly just take the information that they, the USSS site agent and USSS site counterpart, have recommended and put together with the other information that's put together from the other advance entities, and those are all submitted to the field office and then submitted to the Trump detail, the candidate nominations operations, and then they go further to headquarters. In response to questions by the committee regarding responsibility for determining the site perimeter, USSS agents stated that these were joint decisions and no singular individual was responsible. In response to questions by the committee regarding responsibility for security coverage of the AGR building, certain USSS advance agents pointed to state and local law enforcement, but could not say with any specificity how the AGR building would be covered. The CIC of the Pittsburgh field office told the committee that measures for securing the AGR building were briefed through the Donald Trump detail, Trump detail and not through this AIC of the Pittsburgh Field Office and the Trump Detail and the USSS Office of Protective Operations OPO were responsible for reviewing the plans. According to the USSS Assistant Director of OPO, the preliminary survey, which encapsulates the security plan, should get reviewed and approved by the local field office management, in addition to the Trump Detail's operations section. As discussed throughout this section, multiple foreseeable and preventable planning and operational failures by USSS contributed to Crooks's ability to carry out the assassination attempt of former President Trump on July 13. These included unclear roles and responsibilities, insufficient coordination with state and local law enforcement, the lack of effective communications, and inoperable CUA systems, among many others. A. Overview of USSS planning and security assignments for the July 13 rally. Prior to any event requiring USSS protection, USSS assigns an advance team to plan security and obtain needed assets to secure the event. USSS advance team for the Butler rally consisted of a lead advance agent, a site agent, a site counterpart, an intelligence advance agent, and in some cases, a CUA advance agent. Among other potential asset advance agents, depending on a variety of factors, including threat assessments. In 5. USSS's advance agents conduct a series of assessments and prepare documents as part of their planning and security. 26. These documents, collectively known as a Site Security Plan, include a Preliminary Survey, Technical Security Division TSD, Outdoor Site Survey, Site Security Diagrams, Hospital Surveys, Transportation Documents, and Counter Sniper Documents, if such assets are applicable. USSS assigned the following roles to lead the advance planning for the July 13th Rally. USSS Advance Agents Assigned to the July 13th Rally Title Lead Advance Agent Site Agent Site Counterpart Intelligence Advance Agent Technical Security Investigator Counter Sniper Team Leader CUAS Advance Agent Associated Office Pittsburgh Field Office 
Donald Trump Detail, Pittsburgh Field Office, Pittsburgh Field Office, Technical Security Division, Special Operations Division, Donald Trump Detail. According to the USSS SIC of the Pittsburgh Field Office, USSS received pre-approval for 18 posts, which were broken down into jump teams. 28. The SIC of the Pittsburgh Field Office explained that for campaigns, a jump team includes USSS and Homeland Security Investigations HSI agents, per a USSS Memorandum of Understanding. ATF told the committee that there was an ATF agent present in his personal capacity at the Butler rally on July 13, but that ATF as an agency had no official presence at the rally and did not provide any security assistance before shots were fired. The committee has yet to speak with the ATF agent who was at the rally. Due to the size of the Butler venue, the USSS SIC of the Pittsburgh Field Office requested and received additional USSS agents to staff the site. The USSS site diagram depicted below provides an aerial overview of the planning and security posts for the July 13th rally, which are discussed throughout this section. USSS site diagram for the July 13th rally. Evan City, R&D, MAGS, Local TAC, Lynn, Local TAC PO 13, B, Planning Failures. Throughout the week of July 8, USSS advance personnel spoke or met with federal, state and local law enforcement on multiple occasions to identify available assets plan security for the July 13th rally, and conduct site visits to identify areas of concern needed mitigation fence lines, and post positions. 33. Most of the interactions between USSS, federal, state, and local law enforcement were informal, and there appeared to be only two official or planned meetings, which included an initial police briefing for state and local law enforcement on Monday, July 8, and site walkthrough with state and local law enforcement on Thursday, July 11th. The USSS advance agents did not document responsibility for securing the outer perimeter, the area outside the fence lines where individuals would be screened by magnetometers, which included the AGR building. They also did not share planning documents with state or local law enforcement or request state or local operational plans. According to state and local law enforcement officials, USSS received more resources than USSS advance agents requested from state and local law enforcement for the July 13th rally. Multiple USSS advance agents told the committee that they received fewer assets than they had requested from other USSS components. The committee also found that USSS agents involved in the planning process did not have a clear understanding of who was responsible for approving certain documents and requests. USSS advance personnel roles and responsibilities were unclear and lacked accountability. USSS planning leads identified three security perimeters for the July 13th rally. The inner perimeter which included the stage and wherever the protectee is moving the middle perimeter, which included a double fence line and magnetometers, and the outer perimeter, which included anything outside of the fence line and was not secured or off-limits to spectators. The lead advance agent explained, W. Han, we consider a perimeter for Secret Service. The perimeter that we secure is what we are able to secure with SICAR laws and regulations that we operate under. The perimeter on the outside, although it could be secured in other ways, it's not necessarily as hard and as fast as having complete access shut off. The USSS, lead advance planning agents, could not answer questions about who specifically was responsible for determining the perimeter and who approved the designation of the perimeter. For example, when asked who was in charge of determining the perimeter for the Butler Farm Show site, the USSS, lead advance agent, site agent, and site counterpart, each individually explained that it was a joint effort based on available assets. 1. The USSS site agent explained to the committee it was a consensus decision, noting we work together as a team and we submit the required information to the USSS lead advance agent, who then sends to OPO and headquarters. The USSS lead advance agent told the committee, the advance agents put together a draft that is then raised to the, the SIC of the Pittsburgh field office, and then to the Trump detail CNOS operations, and then come back down. The SAC of the Pittsburgh field office told the committee, he was not responsible for reviewing or approving perimeter decisions, as he was not present, or expected to be present, for the walkthrough of the site on the day prior to the rally. The SAIC of the Pittsburgh Field Office told the committee that the reporting, operational planning, and overall approval goes through the Trump detail and OPO, not the SAIC of the local field office. However, the USSS Assistant Director of OPO told the committee that, in addition to the Trump detail, the Pittsburgh Field Office Supervisor and the Lead Advance Agent are responsible for the security plan on the ground. 46. The SIC of the Pittsburgh Field Office also told the committee that if issues were brought to his attention, he would be there to address them, but otherwise it is the detail supervisors who are responsible. USSS failed to sufficiently coordinate with state and local law enforcement. On July 5th, USSS informed PSP and Butler County local law enforcement of former President Trump's planned visit to the Butler County Farm Show, 
USSS did not share materials outlining their expectations and according to state and local law enforcement, planning. Meetings were disorganized and lacked direction. A PSP lieutenant involved in the July 8 planning meeting noted USSS did not have answers to certain questions from PSP, for example, where the stage would be. A Butler ESU commander involved in the advance planning described the July 11 site walkthrough as incredibly disorganized with no coordination. Really just people milling about. I felt like there was no plan. 51 Some USSS leads participated in briefings by telephone or not at all. While some key USSS personnel did not request state and local operational plans in advance of the July 13 rally, the USSS site agent was provided a copy of the PSB operational plan. The SAIC of the Pittsburgh Field Office did not receive the operational plan. Both the SAIC of the Pittsburgh Field Office and the USSS site agent told the committee that state and local partners do not always send operational plans prior to an event. Furthermore, the SAIC of the Pittsburgh Field Office said he was not aware of any USSS policy or procedure to request any state or local operational plans. 5. On Monday, July 8, USSS held a police meeting, led by the lead advance agent. Attendees included USSS, FBI, and state and local law enforcement. During that meeting, USSS explained what assets, resources they wanted each agency to provide. 58. According to local law enforcement, USSS also did not discuss the site perimeter at this meeting. 9. The Butler County ESU commander told the committee that after the police brief, a Butler ESU deputy commander contacted the Beaver County Emergency Service Unit to request additional assistance for the Trump rally, knowing the event was going to be manpower intensive. On Tuesday, July 9, agents from USSS, PSP and Butler County conducted separate site visits at the Butler Farm Show and following their visits, joined together at the Butler Barracks, a local PSP office to review the site on Google Earth. A PSP lieutenant explained, We started just pre-planning the MAP. We were able to draw like the fence line and then show like around like areas that would be of any concern and where we needed to make some, set some posts up which we discussed at a later date. Two below is the initial map created during that meeting. A PSP lieutenant sent this map out to the group, including the USSS lead advance agent and USSS site agent. North, initial map from July 9th meeting, King Cones Castle. F.A. Station A.O.R. Internatio Whitestown R&D E.M.A. Fire. La Parking. Mags. U.S.S.S. Barnes. E.S.U. 1 Barn. Butler Farm Show Inc. Butler Farm. Show Airport F.O.P. E.S.U. 2 Buttercup. Butler Township P.D. County C.P. 70 E. Solution. Hazmat Blocking Truck. Buttercup Road. Entry X. Google Temporarily Closed Tap Room and Grill. U.S.S.S. Did Not Adequately Cover the A.G.R. Building. USSS's protective operations policy documents provide guidance on how to conduct advance planning and secure protective events for former President Trump. Specifically, USSS Protective Operations Manual states, LLL large events should be closely scrutinized by both the site agent and the lead advance agent. Attention should be paid to how attendees may gain access to the protectee's. Despite this guidance, in interviews with the committee, USS agents in charge of the advance planning could not say with any specificity how the AGR building would be covered and who was ultimately responsible for ensuring the AGR building was sufficiently covered. For example, the USSS site agent told the committee that other than the local snipers inside the building, she did not know how the AGR building would be covered, but understood Butler ESU would have coverage of the building. 68. Butler ESU told the committee that they informed USSS they did not have the manpower to lock down the AGR building. But USSS advance agents told the committee Butler local law enforcement never raised these concerns. 9. A Butler ESU police officer told the committee that during a July 11 police walkthrough of the Butler rally site on July 11th led by USSS, he introduced himself to the USSS site agent and USSS site counterpart. I explained where our teams were going to be. I told them that the area along the AGR fence line was a sea concern, the closeness to the S stage, it wasn't a good vantage point for anybody to see even from the venue. Inside. I explained to them there would be cars parking alongside the road because it was close and people walking up. The Butler ASU officer stated that they did not have the manpower to lock down this area and the area referring to the AGR building needed to be locked down. The Butler ESU officer told the committee that in response to these concerns, USSS, specifically the site agent, site counterpart, and counter sniper team leader said they copied and they would take care of it. 72. When the committee interviewed the USSS site agent and asked about this interaction, she stated, it was brought up to our attention that the local Pennsylvania State Police won't have the manpower to secure the building. And at that point, our response was the Butler County ESU would have coverage of the AGR building.
Specifically, the site agent told the committee Butler ESU did not inform her, they did not have the manpower to lock down the building. When the committee asked what steps USSS took to ensure the AGR building was covered, knowing PSP could not secure the building, the site agent told the committee, since it was on the outer perimeter. We did not discuss or plan for having a post stander or having any other asset other than the local counter sniper. Once they decided to have a local counter sniper inside the building for the day. When the committee asked the USSS site counterpart about local law enforcement raising concerns, she stated, that was not a conversation I took part in. The lead advance agent also told the committee she was not aware of local law enforcement raising these concerns. When asked how the AGR building would be covered, the lead advance agent stated, my understanding was that there would be police posts in the area and they would deter and enforce and mitigate anyone that tried to access the building or the area around it. Prior to the July 13th rally, the USSS lead advance agent, counter sniper team leader and site counterpart did not go into the AGR building as part of their advance planning. On the day of the rally, USSS did not sweep the AGR building prior to the rally. When asked by the committee who ultimately was responsible for ensuring there was no unauthorized access of the AGR roof, the lead advance agent stated, There's no specific. There were several different plans in place, different pieces of the puzzle from the advance that all had their own stake in making sure that that building was not accessible. The site agent told the committee, T. AGR building was not part of our site. The AGR building was not considered part of our perimeter. That building was not part of our perimeter, our secure perimeter. When we say, when we identify buildings and surroundings that are outside a perimeter, that's more local law enforcement responsibilities. When the committee asked what specific steps USSS took to ensure the AGR building was covered, the site agent stated, S's, since it was on the outer perimeter, we did not discuss or plan for having a post stander or having any other asset other than the local counter sniper says. However, the USSS counter sniper team leader told the committee that part of the USSS counter sniper's responsibility included scanning for threats regardless of the location, including beyond the perimeter. The committee has interviewed two USSS counter snipers and has requested interviews for the other two USSS counter snipers that were assigned to the July 13 Butler rally. The USSS counter sniper team leader identified the AGR roof as a vulnerability, but did not ensure local snipers could mitigate it. The four USSS counter snipers positioned on two barn roofs behind the stage played a key role in scanning for threats, including on and around the AGR building. In interviews with the committee, the USSS counter sniper team leader stated that part of his job in the advance planning for the event was to identify and mitigate potential vulnerabilities or threats, and that he identified the AGR building, with its line of sight from the roof to the stage, as one such vulnerability. He further stated in his interview that a key component of his plan to mitigate the AGR building vulnerability was himself and his partner in the Hercules One position on the southern barn. Ive. The image below shows the positions of the USSS counter sniper Hercules One and Hercules II positions during the rally, the local snipers in the AGR building, and the likely route crooks took across the roofs to get into position and ultimately shoot. 22. USSS and local sniper positions at July 13th, Rally 87. LS, AC, H1, H2. Source Google Maps. Markings added by the committee. H1, USS Counter Sniper, Hercules 1, HH2, USSS Counter Sniper, Hercules 2S, Stage, LS, local snipers in the AGR building. AC, air conditioning unit where crooks climbed up on the roof. Red arrow, likely root crooks took across the roofs to get into position. C, position from which crooks fired. The USSS counter sniper team leader created a planning document as part of his advance work for the Butler event that he and the other USSS counter snipers would use for planning purposes as well as for communicating about specific locations during the event. The USSS counter sniper team leader told the committee that when he went to the Butler Farm Show site on July 10th before the event, he identified where the USSS counter snipers would be posted and took pictures of the approximate views the sniper teams would have from their postings. These pictures were incorporated in planning documents, like the image below, to be used by the USSS counter sniper teams during the event and included potential areas of vulnerabilities such as the AGR building. This image below does not show the exact view that Hercules II had of the AGR building because it was not taken from the same part of the barn roof where Hercules II was positioned. The counter sniper team leader explained to the committee that he took this picture while standing on the roof of the barn that was in the middle of the Hercules I and Hercules II positions. The USSS counter sniper team leader told the committee that when he went to the roof of the barn where Hercules I and II would be positioned and took the photograph contained in the image below. I actually wasn't looking independently at all the threat areas. It was more to make sure that the roof was secure for us to stand on. Up there, it was really just officer safety. 92. 
This image below does show the trees that partially block the line of sight from the Hercules II position on the northern barn, to the right of the photographer's position, to the right side of the AGR roof from which Crooks fired. The USSS counter-sniper team leader told the committee that when he initially went on the barn roof to take the photograph contained in the above image, I looked over at the AGR building. But I didn't really make a mental note of, hey, this is actually being blocked. It wasn't until later that I was actually doing the grids and doing a 360 that I went, I don't know if you can see that the AGR building from Hercules 2, so I made note of that at the time. But Hercules 1, you had a clear line of sight, so I was okay with it. 94. When the committee asked the USSS counter-sniper team leader if he ever notified the Hercules 2 counter-snipers about the tree-line obstruction of the AGR building, he said, I did not mention to them that hey, part of the AGR building is going to be obscured from you. 95. When the committee asked why the USSS counter-sniper team leader did not mention the obstruction to the Hercules 2 team, he responded, Honestly, I just didn't think about it. This is one of the many threat areas that looked at sick. I wouldn't have mentioned that hey, we can actually see the buildings on the left side, the private residences and the wood line, and you guys can't see that. It's kind of, between each posting, when we're working together, we have full coverage, but there are certain things a certain post would see better than another post. The USSS counter-sniper team leader told the committee that if another USSS counter-sniper had an issue with their post, they could reach out if they had any concerns. But I believe they would understand I did the advance work. This is this line of we can't see a certain threat area. I assume that the advance did his job diligently, which I did and Hercules 1 could see the threat area. After noticing the obstruction of the trees in front of the AGR building, one of the USSS counter-snipers on Hercules 2 told the committee that he and his partner did not notify the USSS counter-sniper team leader because it was assumed that he took the post during his advance procedures and chose that one, regardless of a line of sight issue with the trees, because the AGR building was to be secured by locals. 98. Local snipers explained to the committee they understood their primary areas of responsibility to be the rally crowd. The local snipers also explained that they were positioned behind windows and behind their weapons, which were approximately six to seven feet away from the windows. The image below, created by local law enforcement, identifies seven sectors of coverage responsibility. According to one of the local snipers the committee interviewed, the snipers in the AGR building were responsible for covering part of Sector 2, identified by the dark green box in the above map. Sector 1, the yellow box in the in the above map, and the upper portion of Sector 5, the purple box in the above map. These sectors cover the approximate locations of the rally crowd. No USSS personnel involved with planning who the committee interviewed questioned the local snipers' decisions regarding these positions nor their understanding of their areas of responsibility. As discussed above, the USSS lead advance agent, counter-sniper team leader, and site counterpart did not go into the AGR building as part of their advance planning. Committee staff visited the Butler Farm Show rally site, toured the AGR building, and examined the rooms and views where each local sniper was posted. 105. During the tour, committee staff took photographs from the approximate position of the local snipers in the AGR building on July 13, 2024. As shown in the photographs below, the local snipers had a limited view of the AGR roof based on their positions on July 13 bon 100. View from local sniper post in AGR building, the photograph above shows the approximate field of view from one of the positions occupied by local snipers positioned in AGR building on July 13, 2024. As can be seen in the photograph, from this position, the local sniper would not have been able to see Crooks either during his transit of the roof or when he took his final firing position. Although local snipers would not have been able to see Crooks from their positions, they had access to a break room on the same floor of the AGR building. This break room contained a south-facing window and was closest to the location from which Crooks fired. The photograph below, taken by Comuniti staff, shows the southward view from that AGR window looking out toward the rally site. View from AGR building break room. The roof visible in the foreground of the above photograph is the AGR roof from which Crooks fired. However, this view does not show the actual spot from which Crooks fired, which was on the eastern side of that roof, i.e. to the left, from the perspective of this photograph. In addition, as the above photograph shows, a local sniper positioned in this location would not have been able to provide coverage of the rally crowd, which was their primary area of responsibility. Based on staff's tour of the AGR building, it was possible for a local sniper in the break room to position themselves so as to be able to see Crooks's location on the roof while remaining concealed inside the building. In order to obtain a visual of that spot, a sniper would have had to go to the break room, press up against the window, and look eastward, i.e. to the left. The photograph below was taken by committee staff and shows that view of Crooks's approximate position, indicated with a black arrow from that window, as can be seen in the above photograph. A sniper who assumed this position would have obstructed their view of what was understood to be their primary area of responsibility, the rally crowd. 117. Additionally, 
Local snipers told the committee that their understanding was their role was to act as snipers. Concealed within the AGR building, and looking into the crowd within the rally site for threats as opposed to counter-snipers primarily responsible for looking outside the site for threats from snipers on structures, such as the AGR building. 18. As discussed in the timeline section 4 of below, a local sniper in the AGR building was the first to spot the suspicious person with a rangefinder, which was relayed to USSS. According to the Beaver County ESU commander, if the Beaver County sniper in the AGR building doesn't give that first warning, however long it was, nobody would be looking for that guy. And the two officers who fired at Crooks as the Butler ESU officer and the USSS counter sniper may not have been able to determine where the shots were coming from and to shoot at Crooks as quickly as they did, thereby preventing him from inflicting further harm on former President Trump and rally attendees. During the committee's July 30, 2024 hearing, Acting Director Rowe presented the below photograph, taken from the AGR building, to show local snipers could have seen crooks on the roof from their positions. View from AGR second floor. In regard to this image, Acting Director Rowe stated, This is from the second floor of the AGR building. This point of view is the point of view where the counter sniper team locally was posted. The gold arrow indicates where the shooter fired from. Looking left, why was the assailant not seen? When we were told that building was going to be covered, that there had been a face-to-face -face that afternoon, that our team leads met. This was the view. 122. Local law enforcement snipers stationed in the AGR building who spoke with the committee said that the acting director's assessment did not align with their point of view. When asked about the picture presented by acting director Rowe, one local law enforcement sniper stationed in the AGR building told the committee, I'm not exactly sure where they took those pictures from, but like if they were taken from where I was, they would have been, they would have literally had to been hanging out the window. 134. Multiple law enforcement line of sight concerns were not sufficiently mitigated. In advance of July 13th, the USSS site agent told the committee that the Butler County Farm Show site had many vulnerabilities, which included an airport hangar, multiple buildings, a residential area, rooftops, and empty buildings near the airport. Noting so, everything pretty much surrounding the venue, the site, was pretty much considered a line of sight concern or a vulnerability. USSS and PSP discussed placing farm equipment, bleachers, and other large trucks in certain areas. In an interview with committee staff, the USSS site counterpart said that by Wednesday, July 10th, there were still line-of-sight concerns that needed to be mitigated. The USSS site counterpart tried to put trucks in those positions that I wanted to block, you know, those AGR building. A PSP lieutenant involved in coordinating the planning and security for the rally stated. But, in the end, like, to me, I thought from the way it sounded, like, there was going to be a lot more tractors, vehicles than was actually there. I mean, I think there was only a handful of tractors on this side, and one combine right here. 129. The USSS lead advance agent told the committee she discussed AGR line of sight concerns throughout the week, including the day before the rally, 1.30. The USSS lead advance agent noted that the rally site had still not been built out as of the time I left on Friday, and the second supervisors from the Trump detail were continuing to walk through the site and discussed line of sight and other issues. 131. The USSS site agent told the committee she was not prevented or overruled in using heavy equipment or trucks to mitigate ground line of sight. Ultimately, however, Large trucks were not used. 133. The USSS lead advance agent said, The Penske trucks were in the area at the time, helping with the build-out. Those trucks were not used. They continued to speak about some farm equipment that they had. The counter-sniper teams that we had in place. The police posting we had in place. The screens that were going to be in place. And the bleachers that would be in place, that would all mitigate being able to obstruct line of sight from that area. 134 A USSS counter-sniper in the Hercules II position told the committee he believed the mitigations were sufficient, and the USSS site counterpart told the committee she believed they had a good security plan for the July 13 rally, as resource requests for additional assets were denied and others were not made. PSP initially told USSS they would be able to provide 10 to 15 troopers, but ultimately provided a total of 30 troopers, including 22 troopers on site. The Butler County ESU sent three sniper teams and approximately 20 to 25 officers. 137. The USSS Trump detail requested specific assets for the July 13th rally that were not approved. 138. These included CUAs and UAs resources, which are discussed below, and a counter-assault team liaison. President Trump's USSS detail requested counter-assault team liaisons to help coordinate tactical assets in advance of the July 13th rally. But other USSS components denied this request. 140. The lead advance agent also told the committee she requested 13 magnetometers from USSS, but only received 10. In addition, the USSS site counterpart told the committee that having a counter-surveillance unit CSU would have been helpful, and she was surprised USSS 
did not have a CSU for an outdoor event, is used to identify and observe outer perimeter areas from which significant threats could originate. 143. The USSS Assistant Director of OPO also told the committee that a large outdoor venue would lend itself for requesting a CSU-type asset, and that a CSU may have helped because an area of focus for CSU is to look for that pre-attack behavior. 144. The USSS site agent also told the committee having a CSU asset would have been helpful for the July 13th rally. While former President Trump did not have a CSU for the outdoor rally that was expected to have 15,000 attendees on July 13th, the First Lady did have a CSU assigned for her indoor event in the same area, had 410 expected attendees. According to the USSS site counterpart, the First Lady regularly receives CSU. The lead advance agent told the committee she was not aware of any discussions to request a CSU for the July 13th rally, noting, it's not a typical asset for an advance for a former president that I had worked at that time. 148. The site counterpart for the July 13th rally noted that advance agents often already know what assets will be provided before putting in a request. A lot of times I think it is like, you can make the request, but you know what you're going to get, explaining, we have limited, you know, manpower, limited resources, especially during a campaign, is sick. It's always an issue. Resources and manpower. The fact that USSS was responsible for providing security for two protectees in the Pittsburgh area on July 13th, former President Trump's event in Butler and the First Lady's event in the city of Pittsburgh, resulted in shared USSS assets at the Pittsburgh airport. Although the site counterpart for the Butler rally acknowledged that resources could be strained by asset sharing between protectees, she told the committee that she was confident that there was not going to be any resource issues during this specific arrangement because she had previously worked with a local law enforcement entity providing the shared coverage. She said that if any issues did arise, I think it would have been an easy and quick adjustment if needed. 152. When asked if protective glass had been discussed for the July 13 event, the site agent told the committee that on protective events she had worked, former presidents typically did not have this asset. The agent added that, in her opinion definitely would be beneficial to have protective glass. Errors in security planning documents. At least two documents that USSS officials created, detailing security specifications and asset postings, for the July 13 rally, contained errors regarding the positions of the local counter snipers at the event. One document, the preliminary survey, which contains information about the positions of assets, radio frequencies, and many other items, contained inaccurate information regarding the positions of the local counter snipers at the July 13 rally. In an interview with the committee, the USSS site agent for the July 13 rally who contributed to the preliminary survey acknowledged that the accuracy of the document is important. In the document, it stated local CS counter sniper team, elevated 4 o'clock and 8 o'clock barn roof, 156, when asked about the accuracy of that information. The site agent acknowledged that this was not the actual position of the local counter sniper teams. 157. The agent continued. Oh. NCE the paperwork is submitted. We normally brief during the post-standard briefing to make sure that everybody is aware of tactical assets or special tacticals from local law enforcement. And that was briefed as part of, if there's any corrections or anything that needs to be addressed prior to the visit or even during the post-standard briefing, which is what we did once we noticed that there was some misinformation or not, something that was not correct. We make sure that we brief that during the day of the visit to ensure that everybody is aware of tactical elements or positioning of local assets. Another document, the site diagram, which contains overhead images of site venues and lists assets for those venues, also contains similar. Inaccurate information listing local CS counter sniper team, elevated 4 o'clock and 8 o'clock barn roof. The site agent, who also contributed to this document, confirmed that the location of the local counter sniper teams presented in this site diagram was also not accurate. The site agent submitted this paperwork with the errors to the lead advance agent for the July 13th rally. 161. The lead advance agent supervisor did not review the preliminary survey until after it had already been approved and submitted. 162. The lead advance agent did not catch the error before she submitted the document to the Trump detail. The lead advance agent told the committee, However, I put those papers together with the best of my ability, I observed them, and those errors that were found were addressed when they were found. 164 The lead advance agent stated, I did review. There was information that I missed on the page, and that was corrected in a briefing that happened later that evening. And that, T. Counter Sniper Advance, sent an email with his documents, that had in the body of the email the correct locations of the counter sniper teams and the local sniper teams. And that was what was briefed. 165. C. Communications failures. Multiple USSS officials, including Acting Director Rowe, have acknowledged communications failures on July 13, XX. 
Several USSS personnel at the rally have told the committee that they were not notified about the suspicious person with a rangefinder, and that if they had been, there may have been time to take action prior to shots being fired. 167. The site counterpart explained, There's a lot of things that could have been done, but it has to be relayed. It has to be communicated, in order for those to be put in place. I didn't know anything was going on. I can't put out fires that I don't know exist. The USSS site agent told the committee that if she had known law enforcement was trying to locate a suspicious person, she would have passed that information along to the supervisors of former President Trump's detail, who could make the decision whether to remove him from the stage. 169. The USSS lead advance agents the committee has interviewed stated that they were not aware of any discussions that day about potentially removing former President Trump from the stage. 170. In an interview with the committee, the assistant director of the USSS OPO said, Clearly, there were communication gaps that day that led to this failure. And if those communication gaps had been mitigated, information could have been passed in a more timely fashion that would have avoided that failure. When asked by the committee to provide additional detail on what specific communication gaps he was referring to, the assistant director stated, Well, I did not conduct the advance. I don't have first-hand knowledge. But based on information I've learned after the fact, and even one could almost observe from a third-party perspective, the communications plan was, in my opinion, siloed. We had a security room with a Secret Service supervisor, a member of the Pennsylvania State Police, and then approximately 120 yards to 300 yards away. You had a mobile command post with the various law enforcement agencies represented. So, I will speak in generalities to answer your question. In law enforcement, one of the most basic tenets is one has to be able to communicate. What frustrates me, and maybe I'm dating myself, but I keep hearing about technology and this and that and the other thing, and, or some panacea radio type system where, again, if you just had a well-staffed, unified command post with law enforcement, appropriately located for command and control, and the ability to contemporaneously communicate and pass information, we wouldn't have had, or, I'll say, I don't have all the facts to the investigation, but you won't have stovepipe communications that can cause failures that we saw up at Butler, as a result of communication being delayed. This individual was walking around for an hour, but somehow information seemed to be getting stovepiped. Sometimes in law enforcement, there isn't a script for every play or every scenario you may encounter, but just by sitting in that unified command post, oh, what did you hear? There's a guy, so-and-so. And oftentimes, that's how information in reality is going to get passed. Even if you had one radio communication frequency and everyone could speak on, it would be worthless because everyone would be stepping on each other. And oftentimes in exigent situations, you can take there, you can't even talk on the radio. But it's that lead up prior to something becoming kinetic, which is essential in that command and control. So, if the information is correct, which I don't have first-hand knowledge of, but there was a Secret Service security room with only a Secret Service supervisor and a member of the Pennsylvania State Police, why would you not embed them in that unified mobile command post to have that command and control? If there was an incident or something percolating, establish that jurisdictional deconfliction and address the issue. I mean, if I was to use an analogy, if there's any football fans... If we have the coach calling in the plays to the quarterback, and we have the defensive coordinator on the same radio frequency, it's not going to work. So, I don't really put much stock in the whole, there's been this whole notion of radios and radio. You establish a unified command so people can communicate and collaborate and reach out to their respective entities. Key USSS personnel were never informed that local law enforcement was searching for a suspicious person with a rangefinder prior to shots being fired. After a local sniper first observed crooks with a rangefinder at 5.32 p.m., Local and state law enforcement officials acted promptly to notify others, including USSS. As detailed below, by 5.52 p.m., at least eight USSS personnel had been notified of the suspicious person. The PSP sergeant in the USSS security room notified the USSS security room agent verbally at approximately 5.44 p.m. and shared photos of crooks with the USSS CUAS advance agent at approximately 5.48 p.m. The CUAS advance agent passed the photos and description of crooks, along to the USSS Counter Sniper Response Team Agent by text message at 5.52 p.m. 17. The Butler ESU Sniper Team Leader notified the USSS Counter Sniper Team Leader at 5.45 p.m. via text message, and that USSS Counter Sniper Team Leader told the committee he found the report of a rangefinder extremely suspicious, who then notified the other three USSS Counter Snipers by email at 5.52 p.m. Additionally, a USSS protective intelligence agent at the rally site was also looking into the suspicious person report around this time. The CUAs and intelligence advance agents told the committee that after learning of the suspicious person, the USSS counter-sniper response team agent and USSS protective intelligence agent 
engaged in the on-the-ground effort to locate the individual. Several USSS personnel told the committee they were not aware that these agents had been deployed in a search of any kind. Additionally, the site agent and counter-sniper team leader stated that they would typically be made aware if the counter-sniper response team is deployed in a search, and that they should have been told on July 13 one. Despite the fact that multiple USSS personnel were aware that local law enforcement identified a suspicious person with a rangefinder, and some USSS personnel were actively engaged in the search, others including the USSS. Lead advance agent, site agent, site, counterpart, and counter-assault team leader did not receive this information until after shots were fired. 180. USSS officials expected the USSS security room would relay relevant information from all law enforcement agencies. Several of the USSS personnel who did not learn of the suspicious person with a rangefinder until after the shooting told the committee that they expected the USSS security room would relay relevant information from all law enforcement agencies working at the rally site. According to the PSP sergeant who was stationed in the USSS security room, he initially told the security room agent about the suspicious person with a rangefinder approximately 27 minutes prior to the shooting and that the suspicious individual was on the AGR building roof approximately two minutes before the shooting. The PSP sergeant stated that he was not aware of what, if anything, the security room agent did with the information. The committee has not yet interviewed the security room agent to determine what he did with that information. Additionally, the committee was not able to review radio communications made from the USSS security room because, as acting USSS Director Rowe stated in his testimony to the committee on July 30th, the USSS did not record its radio transmissions. On July 13th, USSS officials told the committee that radio communications are often recorded at protective events but that the recording capability was not available at the rally. Siloed communications hindered information sharing at the July 13th rally. USSS, state, and local law enforcement operated on multiple separate radio channels. At the July 13th rally, the USSS operated at least three radio channels, each designated for different categories of personnel. PSP operated on two radio channels, a primary channel that all PSP officers were instructed to monitor, and a secondary channel, 187, Local law enforcement operated on three radio channels on July 13th, a tactical channel for local snipers and members of the Quick Response Force and counter-assault teams, a patrol channel for local post standers and patrol officers, and a third channel for members of the Butler County Sheriff's Department. USSS uses encrypted radio frequencies, which are not accessible without a USSS-issued radio. According to Butler County ESU police officers, no local law enforcement officials were given a USSS radio on July 13th and no one from USSS had a Butler County-issued radio, 190. Similarly, all of the USSS personnel the committee interviewed stated that they did not personally have a local radio or access to local radio channels. 1. Based on its interviews with USSS personnel and local law enforcement, the committee could not confirm anyone in USSS had a local radio, nor any local law enforcement had a USSS radio. Several USSS personnel told the committee that it is a common practice to exchange radios with local partners to facilitate communications during protective events. However, they noted that it is not a required practice, and it is more common when tactical officers conduct on-site advance work for several days prior to a protective event, which was not the case for the July 13th rally. 194. One USSS officer, the counter-sniper team leader, was offered a local radio on July 13th, but he did not pick it up. The counter-sniper team leader told the committee that when he met with local snipers at the rally, they offered him a local radio. According to the USSS counter-sniper team leader and Butler County ESU officials, he did not pick up a local radio that day. 190s. The counter-sniper team leader told the committee that he intended to pick up a local radio, but did not have time due to technical issues with his USSS radio he needed to. Resolve first. He explained that by the time those problems were addressed, he needed to get into his assigned position on the barn roof. On 99, in addition to radio exchanges, USSS officials noted that another common practice for facilitating communications is for USSS and local law enforcement to call, locate, or embed tactical personnel. On July 13, a Butler ESU tactical officer was embedded with a USSS counter-assault team, meaning he was stationed in close proximity to them throughout the day. 201 both USSS counter-assault team members told the committee that a primary purpose of having the local officer embedded with them was to ensure they had a direct line of communication with local tactical assets. USSS and local law enforcement operated separate communication centers. Several USSS personnel the committee spoke to explained that a command post or security room is used at protective events to facilitate communications among USSS, as well as between the USSS and its state and local. Partners, 203. USSS operated a security room at the July 13th rally. 
and Butler County law enforcement ran a separate command post for local law enforcement agencies. The posts were at least 120 to 300 yards distance from each other. 204. The USSS security room, and the local command post's primary means of communication with each other, was by cell phone, not radio. The graphic below depicts the multi-step process for information to travel from local law enforcement to the USSS security room, as described by Butler ESU. The Butler ESU commander maintained radio contact with the local law enforcement officers working the rally. If he wanted to relay information he heard from local radio channels to USSS, the Butler ESU commander would use his cell phone to call the PSP sergeant in the USSS security room. The PSP sergeant stated that he would then relay information verbally to the USSS security room agent, who had the ability to contact USSS agents in the field over the USSS radio. 2 and 9. The committee has not yet interviewed the USSS security room agent. Law enforcement officers routinely communicated by cell phone. Several law enforcement personnel at the July 13th rally also used cell phones to communicate. All of the local snipers at the rally were on a group text chain, in addition to being on the same radio channel, 210. USSS and local law enforcement officials told the committee that one reason text messages or email will be used is to send images or photographs. Bun. In some instances, such as between the PSP sergeant in the USSS security room and the Butler ESU commander in the local command post. Cell phones were the primary or only direct method of communication between certain entities. As depicted in the graphic below, cell phones were also the primary method of communication between the local snipers via the Butler ESU sniper team leader and USSS counter snipers during the July 13th rally. Text and email communication between local snipers and USSS counter snipers as described in more detail in the timeline in section I4 below. The local sniper in the AGR building, who first observed crooks with a rangefinder, sent a text message on the local sniper chain with pictures and a description of crooks. The Butler ESU sniper team leader, who was on the text chain, passed that information along to the USSS counter sniper team leader by text message, who then emailed the information and photos to the other USSS counter snipers. The USSS counter sniper team leader told the committee that relying on cell phones was not great but better than nothing. 217 he also explained, radios are preferred. They're instantaneous. But they didn't have our radios. We didn't have their radios. 218, however. The USSS counter sniper team leader also noted that if radios are being difficult and, or there's just a lot of traffic, the cell phone is always an option too. 219. Radio problems added to communications challenges at the July 13th rally. The committee's been made aware of multiple instances of USSS dealing with faulty radio equipment on the day of the July 13th rally. USSS personnel told the committee that it is standard practice at protective events to scan multiple USSS radio channels to maintain awareness of relevant USSS communications. 20. However, the committee has asked for and not been provided all unredacted standard operating procedures related to communications. On July 13, the site counterpart's regular USSS issued radio was unable to scan, and it could only connect to one channel at a time. 21. On the day of the rally, the USSS site counterpart sent a text message to the site agent and lead advance agent, so I think my radio is screwed up of course. I've had problems ever since I got the new radio, been on the phone with the radio folks, and they think there is a problem as well. In another USSS text message on July 13th at 5.13pm, a USSS employee, whose name is redacted, wrote, I'm not getting good comms on either my phone or radio I'll try to stay on. On the day of the rally. USSS changed the post standards radio frequency due to bleed over from other radio traffic, meaning that USSS radios at the Butler Rally site were picking up transmissions they believed to be coming from the First Lady's USSS detail nearby. USSS personnel told the committee that this type of issue is common when multiple protective details are in the same area. 225. The two USSS counter snipers that had been interviewed by the committee both reported experiencing issues with their radios at the rally. One said that the orientation of his USSS-issued radio antenna can affect the signal and it can become spotty if angled towards the ground. He also recalled problems caused by his radio being in close proximity to his partner's radio while they were in position on the barn roof, saying the radio frequencies will sometimes cancel out and one of them will receive a transmission but the other will not. The counter. Sniper team leader told the committee that he experienced interference on his radio channels and had to spend time troubleshooting, resulting in him being unable to pick up a local radio on July 13, 128. The USSS Say Ike of the Pittsburgh field office did not have a working radio on his person during his entire time at the July 13th rally. The lead advance agent said that while at the Pittsburgh airport waiting for former President Trump to arrive, her radio dropped code, meaning she could hear some radio traffic, but wouldn't be able to communicate back. 229 since the lead advance agent would be traveling to the rally in the motorcade and giving vehicle directions along the way. 
her supervisor, the SAIC of the Pittsburgh field office, made the decision to give her his own radio. The SIC told the committee, IT was more important for the lead advance agent to have communications with everybody than for myself at that point. The SIC also told the committee that upon arriving at the Butler Farm show grounds, he intended to code the lead advance agent's radio in the security room, but learned at the security room that the coder was back at the motorcade. Boom 31. The SIC was walking back from the security room to the motorcade in order to obtain the coder when shots were fired. The SIC told the committee that while he was in the Trump motorcade heading to the rally, he was riding with another USSS official who had a working radio, and that, on the day of the visit and during the visit, I act more in a liaison capacity. I don't hold a post or a sector. I'm not part of any protective formation. 233 instead, the SIC said. I'm there just if something comes up and somebody needs help, or if there's something with our local or state partners or something else comes up, I'm there to help assist with that. Having given the lead advance agent his working radio, and unable to code the lead advance agent's radio, the SIC did not have direct access to any radio communications with other USSS agents while he was at the rally. Responsibilities for the USSS security room were not well defined or clearly understood. In addition to a lack of clarity regarding how information should be shared between the USSS and its state and local partners, some of the protocols and expectations for communications within USSS were also unclear. While USSS personnel the committee spoke to agreed that the security room was a critical component of the overall communications plan for the July 13th rally, they did not agree about who was responsible for ensuring the security room was functioning as intended. Norton 36. According to USSS policy, the site agent is responsible for coordinating the security room's physical setup and staffing. However, the site agent for the July 13th rally told the committee that she was not the primary person responsible for the security room's physical setup and staffing. Shuin 38. She said that she was involved in the setup, working in coordination with the site counterpart, but that the site counterpart coordinated equipment and ensured the security room was adequately staffed. In her view, security room equipment and staffing is a responsibility of the local field office, in this case, Pittsburgh. When asked about responsibility for the security room setup and staffing, the site counterpart told the committee that the site agent's really responsible for making sure that the security room set up and that there's communications. 241. The lead advance agent told the committee that both the site agent and site counterpart were responsible for making sure that the site has adequate resources and everything that was part of the plan is in place. She explained that during the July 8 police meeting, she had invited all state and local agencies participating in rally security to have someone present in the USSS security room. 240. However, she stated that there was no specific follow-up regarding which state and local entities would actually be present in the security room. 104. Some USSS officials told the committee they expected that local law enforcement entities working at the rally would have a representative in the USSS security room, but many were not certain about which local agencies, if any, were present in the security room on July 13th when asked how the USSS was supposed to communicate with local law enforcement at the July 13th rally. The site agent told the committee, that's the reason why there should be a local counterpart from each department inside the security room, to ensure that everyone has some communications and everyone is clear. On the same page. D. I got him. USSS counter snipers and local snipers describe line of sight and communication limitations. Radio logs obtained by the committee show that the local snipers positioned in the AGR building did not receive any notification on their ESU radio channel about an individual on the roof before crooks fired. And the Beaver County sniper that was posted in the AGR building told the committee that neither he nor his partner in the AGR building were aware of anyone on the roof before shots were fired. The committee learned that a Butler Township police officer responded to the AGR building to look for the suspicious person and saw a person with a book bag running on the roof of the AGR building from the north and south across the building towards the stage but he did not send out a radio alert about the individual on the roof at that point. On July 13th, the four USSS counter-snipers assigned to the Butler rally were split into two two-man teams identified by USSS as Hercules 1 and Hercules 2. The image below depicts the positions of law enforcement at the Butler rally, with two arrows pointing at the locations of the USSS counter-sniper Hercules teams. Butler County ESU site map as depicted in the above image, Hercules 1 was positioned on the rooftop of the southern barn, and Hercules 2 was positioned on the rooftop of the northern barn. The Hercules 2 counter sniper team's responsibility included scanning the area around the AGR building for threats, though their view of the AGR building was partially obstructed by trees 250. The USSS counter sniper team leader, along with his partner, were Ka, located at the Hercules 1 post. Although, Hercules I did have a clear line of sight of the AGR building, 
the USSS counter sniper team leader told the committee that the majority of his time he was facing basically the same direction as the stage. 252. At approximately 5.45 p.m., the USSS counter sniper team leader received text messages from a local sniper regarding an individual near the AGR building with a rangefinder looking toward the stage. 253. The text messages included two pictures of Crooks 254. Within a minute, the USSS counter sniper team leader responded, Roger. I'll notify teams on AGR side. 255 then, at 5.52 p.m., the USSS counter sniper team leader emailed the USSS counter snipers the information he received from the local sniper. Regarding an individual with a rangefinder near the AGR building, kid learning around building we are in. AGR I believe it is. I did see him with a rangefinder looking towards stage. For your information if you want to notify SS snipers to look out. I lost sight of him. Also a bike with backpack sitting next to it in rear of building that was not seen earlier. United States Secret Service Special Operations Division Counter Sniper Team. The 5.52 p.m. email above included two images of crooks, although his identity was unknown at the time. In reference to this email, one of the Hercules II USSS Counter Sniper Team members told the committee that this, bolo or be on the lookout email, was worded vaguely. 258, but he and his partner continued to search and observe the site. 259, the Hercules II Counter Sniper testified, after we were searching for several minutes, I saw two white vehicles pull into the AGR parking lot, but they were obscured by that tree line that I previously mentioned. And from those two vehicles, I saw one individual emerge from the tree line, identified him as a police officer, and I couldn't tell why he was moving urgently. But I went over the radio with the following transmission, security room from Hercules. Locals are working something at the 3 o'clock, approximately 200 yards out. The USSS counter sniper team leader saw local law enforcement running toward the AGR building with their guns drawn but did not radio the Trump detail to remove Trump from the stage. According to the USSS counter sniper team leader, as soon as he and his partner both at the Hercules One post heard this radio transmission, they repositioned themselves to face the AGR building. The USSS counter sniper team leader told the committee, W. E. repositioned ourselves so that our tripod was on the center of the roof, the peak, and then we were standing on the, I guess, the farthest edge that away from the AGR building. So we were facing the AGR building. W. E. had all focus on that building around that building, trying to figure out what was happening. W. E. placed our rifles in the tripods and started searching through the rifle scopes themselves. The USSS counter sniper team leader could not recall the exact time that he and his partner repositioned themselves to face toward the AGR building. He estimated that it was close to minutes between the time he received the Hercules II USSS counter sniper's radio transmission and when shots were fired. 265. The Hercules II USSS counter sniper told the committee that it could have been a minute or two between his radio transmission and the first shots. However, in that short amount of time, the counter sniper team leader told the committee what he witnessed unfolding in front of the AGR building when he and his partner turned to face the AGR building. W. Henry looked, just plain eyes, no optics or anything. You could see police running towards the building with their hands on their pistols. I think one actually had a pistol facing towards the ground, out of a holster. That's a pretty big deal for us. So immediately we turned and faced our guns towards the threat area. We didn't know what was happening, but it seemed pretty serious, especially with the locals' response. In 60, there were police running, guns out, and there were a couple of people just running away from the AGR building. That looks like citizens, I guess you would say. Just normal people. So something was wrong. We didn't know what. But there was a lot going on in that moment. The police were the main identifier that something bad was happening. Despite this, the USSS counter sniper team leader did not relay this information to anyone on the radio. The USSS counter sniper team leader explained this decision to the committee below. Question. Answer. So why not, in that moment, send a signal or a radio call saying, do not let the protectee on the stage, or if the protectee was already on the stage, take him off. At that time, we didn't know what we were working with. Obviously, police are running towards a situation. That could be anything from a medical situation to potentially a man with a gun or some sort of violent situation. We didn't know what we were having, and I didn't have enough to go over the radio with same exact communication of the police are working a situation at the 3 o'clock. We know they're working. What are they working on? We don't know. We're trying not to clog the radio. Understood. You mentioned you saw someone with their gun drawn. Mm hmm. Hmm. That seems like an extremely serious situation, more than just looking for a suspicious person. Answer. Yes. Question. Answer. Question. Answer. Question. Answer. It seems like a major elevation of a threat level. Correct? That's why we placed our rifles in the tripods and started searching through the rifle scopes themselves. But beyond that, is that not enough to say we have something imminent happening here, 
if their guns are drawn and we need to ensure the safety of the protectee? Potentially. It definitely is elevated. We're trying to figure out what's happening. It's happening very quickly. It's a very dynamic situation. But, did the thought even cross your mind that you should inform someone to keep the protectee from going on stage? Or, if he was already on stage, take him back? Did that thought even cross your mind? The thought did not cross my mind. It was more find out what's happening, figure out what's happening. Can we help? Can we take action? 269. The USSS counter sniper team leader told the committee that if he did go on the radio to notify USSS to remove the protectee from a potentially dangerous situation, there will be no questions asked, and that'll happen. Based on the estimated likely route, Crooks took across the roofs of the AGR buildings starting at 6.05 p.m. on July 13th. The USSS counter snipers in the Hercules line position could have had a direct line of sight to him for at least part of his movements across the roofs. To one sub the photograph below was taken by committee staff from an AGR roof looking southward toward the USSS Hercules 1 position on the southern barn behind the stage, i.e., the red barn on the right in this photograph below. The AGR property is a complex of buildings with a series of connected roofs, crooks fired from the AGR roof peak closest to the stage, and there are two additional roof peaks beyond, i.e., to the north of that roof, all of which are connected and able to be traversed on foot. The photograph below was taken from the third, i.e., northernmost, of those three roofs, looking back past Crooks's shooting position, and on to the Hercules I position. As the photograph below shows, the Hercules I position had a direct line of sight to portions of these three roofs. View from AGR building roof, when shown the photograph above of these three roof peaks during the committee's interview. The USSS counter-sniper team leader who was in the Hercules I position, i.e., on the roof of the red barn on the right in the photograph above, acknowledged that with the view he had of the AGR building. If someone were standing on those three roofs or walking across them, he could have been able to see them. From our position you should have line of sight, yes. However, the USSS counter-sniper team leader and the Hercules II USSS counter-sniper said they never saw crooks on the roof prior to shots being fired. Although FBI confirmed the subject's movement across multiple AGR building roofs between 6.05 and 6.08 p.m., the committee cannot know for certain that the Hercules I USSS counter-snipers would have spotted him if they were facing that direction at that time. Crooks was in the USSS counter sniper's sights for mere seconds before he fired at Crooks. The two USSS counter snipers interviewed by the committee both confirmed that the USSS counter sniper team leader's partner on Hercules 1 fired his weapon at Crooks. Do 78. The committee has requested to interview the USSS counter sniper who shot Crooks, but has not yet interviewed him. The USSS counter sniper team leader told the committee that prior to his team member firing his weapon, he distinctly heard three shots. 279. He then heard his USSS counter-sniper partner tell him, I got him. The USSS counter-sniper team leader stated, I immediately gave him a wind call. When you're doing a shooter, spotter, a wind call is basically any adjustments you'd have to make to the wind, but at 200 yards it's minimal. The counter-sniper team leader continued, F. Rom there I heard his round go off. I still couldn't find what he was shooting at, so I got off my gun and looked to see what angle he was looking at. I figure out he was looking at the roof, got on, and then I saw the target that he had shot at. 2 and 82. The committee asked the counter sniper team leader how long his partner on Hercules 1 had crooks in his sights before firing, and he responded, mere seconds. 283. The counter sniper team leader confirmed to the committee that, to his knowledge, USSS counter snipers fired only one shot at crooks, 284 further. The USSS counter snipers the committee spoke with confirmed that USSS counter snipers do not need permission to fire at a shooter. They also said that no permission was requested or required during the July 13th rally. One of the counter snipers on the Hercules 2 team told the committee that after hearing shots fired, he thought that his partner was hit, due to the proximity of these whip like cracks. The USSS counter sniper added that after the shooting, he told the committee that he asked my partner how close he thought the rounds were to our left, and he looked at me and said, I heard them on my right, and that Ray were approximately six feet between him and I, when we were on the rooftop at the main site. 287 The committee cannot confirm whether any bullets passed by any of the USSS counter snipers. The committee has not yet spoken to the other USSS counter sniper on the Hercules 2 team about these statements. E. Intelligence concerns. The July 13th rally was the first time USSS sent counter snipers for a protectee other than the president, vice president, or a presidential candidate who had been formally nominated by his or her party. 288. According to the USSS assistant director of OPO, prior to July 5th, the then deputy assistant director in the SSIC of the Special Operations Division, agreed that USSS headquarters would send USSS counter snipers to all outdoor events for former President Trump going forward. 289. In his interview with the committee, 
the USSS Assistant Director of OPO said this decision was based on several factors, including the size and scale of the former president's outdoor events, his being on the cusp of becoming the nominee, and threat information, at least some of which is classified. To date, the committee has not been provided any additional detail related to the USSS's decision in early July to send countersnipers to outdoor events going forward. Aside from Assistant Director of OPO's testimony, provided during his transcribed interview, it appears that the addition of the USSS countersnipers to the security detail at the rally was a direct result of credible intelligence. However, only two of the USSS personnel the committee has interviewed were made aware that there was a credible threat related to former President Trump prior to July 13, only one of whom was made aware of the classified information underlying the threat. A USSS official was made aware that credible intelligence existed of a threat but still wrote in a security planning document that there was no adverse intelligence concerning the visit to Butler, Pennsylvania. The USSS lead advance agent told the committee that on July 9, 2024, she received a call from the second supervisor of the Trump detail, telling her that USSS countersnipers would be assigned to the rally. The lead advance agent told the committee that the second supervisor of the Trump detail informed her that the reason USSS was assigning countersnipers was because of credible intel that he could not discuss further with her. 294. The lead advance agent told the committee that she instructed the second supervisor to call her supervisor, the SIIC of the USSS Pittsburgh field office, to discuss the credible intel, and stated, Lead advance agent, he said that there was credible intelligence that he could not speak about, and that we were going to get Secret Service counter-sniper advance for that reason. Question, and did he say why he couldn't speak about it? Lead advance agent, because it was information that he wasn't able to pass. Question, did he say it was classified? Lead advance agent, he did not use the word classified on the phone, but from my general knowledge when you say that you cannot pass something on the phone, the understanding is that it's classified, and he can't speak about it on the phone. Top 296. When the lead advance agent told the Pittsburgh CIC that USSS countersnipers were being assigned to the rally because the second supervisor expressed that there was credible intelligence, she said the SIC did not have any awareness of this information prior to their discussion. The Pittsburgh CIC, however, told the committee that the lead advance agent did not relay this information to him, to 98. He said that he first became aware that USSS countersnipers were coming to the event through an email requesting housing for them. With the committee, the Pittsburgh CIC said, Question, do you know why so I guess stepping back, was that the first time you had heard about even a request for countersnipers? Pittsburgh CIC, I did not even know a request was made. Question, okay. Do you know why they were sent? Pittsburgh CIAC, I don't. The CIC said, if he had been made aware of intelligence regarding a potential threat, he would have requested more specific information about the threat and might have pushed for the event to be moved indoors if it was deemed too risky for an outdoor venue. Additionally, the CIC told the committee that he would have requested more assets if he had received this information. And two, despite learning on July 9th that based on credible intelligence of a threat, USSS counter-sniper assets would be provided for the July 13th rally. The lead advance agent wrote in the intelligence section of the preliminary survey document that, ah, that this time, no adverse intelligence has been developed concerning this visit. Any adverse intelligence that may arise will be passed on to all working supervisors. Snapshot from Preliminary Survey, Intelligence Section 304, SA Intelligence. Is the intelligence advance for this visit? At this time, no adverse intelligence has been developed concerning this visit. Any adverse intelligence that may arise will be passed to all working supervisors. In response to questions from the committee regarding why she specifically wrote that no adverse intelligence has been developed. Concerning this visit, despite the information provided on July 9th, the lead advance agent said, At the time I filled out this document, my understanding was that there was no adverse intelligence to pass on to the group as a whole. This is not all, encompassing as to intelligence, whether or not it can be passed. If it's something classified, such as something that was not passed to me to begin with, then that would not be put in writing as well. It would have been passed to those that needed to know in this situation. It is unclear who else involved in the planning for the July 13th rally, besides the lead advance agent, had knowledge of the credible intelligence. The Pittsburgh CIC told 62. Committee that it would be his expectation that any credible threat or intelligence would appear in the intelligence section in the preliminary survey. Other USSS officials involved in the planning of the rally told the committee they had no knowledge of any threats, and the FBI did not respond to USSS's intelligence request. The FBI has stated that Crooks's was not known to the FBI prior to the assassination attempt. The FBI also communicated to the committee and publicly stated that the arrest on July 12, 2024 of Asif Merchant, a Pakistan national with ties to Iran, 
for plotting to commit murder for hire of U.S. government officials was not connected to the attempted assassination of former President Trump. The committee has requested additional documents and information about this matter and has yet to receive a response. In public updates on August 28, 2024 regarding its ongoing investigation, FBI Executive Assistant Director Robert Wells also stated, There is. T. The FBI has not identified a motive nor any key O conspirators or associates of crooks with advanced knowledge of the attack. And I want to be clear, we have not seen any indication to suggest crooks. Was directed by a foreign entity to conduct the attack. 310. Additionally, the FBI Deputy Director testified on July 30, 2024, to the committee that a. An integrated relationship between FBI and Secret Service and every other federal, state, local agency you can imagine. We have constructs like the Joint Terrorism Task Forces and Violent Crime. Task Forces where we're cross-embedded with each other. And, when it comes to this event and others like it, we're always talking in advance. In fact, with respect to this event, we did have a meeting between U.S. Secret Service and FBI in the days leading up to the event to determine, assess, whether there was any information or intelligence pertaining to a threat against the rally, or to former President Trump, or anyone else. There, there was an absence of that in the lead-up specifically, and again, none of us had any information in our holdings with regard to the, to the ultimate shooter, 311. Nonetheless, the decision to send counter-snipers to the July 13th rally, which was based on credible intelligence of a threat, potentially saved lives. The July 13th rally was the first time USSS sent counter-snipers for a protectee, other than the president, vice president, or a presidential candidate who had been formally nominated by his or her party. On July 9th, the lead USSS agent received a phone call from a supervisor in the Trump detail, who stated, there was credible intelligence that he could not speak about, and that we were going to get Secret Service counter-sniper advance for the July 13th rally. The lead advance agent asked that this information be relayed to the CIC of the Pittsburgh field office, but it never was. USSS has not provided the committee with any information confirming that this information was ever shared with any other USSS personnel responsible for planning the July 13th rally, including the USSS site agent. USSS Counter Assault Team, Site Counterpart, Intelligence Advance Agent, Technical Security Division TSD Advance, or the CUAS Advance Agent, or any state or local law enforcement officials. In response to questions regarding whether advance planning leads would have expected to be made aware of any credible intelligence or threats, USSS agents told the committee that information is something they absolutely should have been aware of prior to the July 13th rally. The site agent told the committee, as a site agent or lead advance agent assigned, you should have any intelligence or any information pertaining to an active threat to a particular protectee, absolutely. In case that we need to take, you know, take additional measures, or maybe plan for additional assets or additional resources for that particular matter. So it shocked me, like just being out there. They're planning to have a protectee with 15, 20,000 people in an outdoor event when there's an active threat for the drone attack. That was definitely one thing that obviously raised my concerns, and I know everyone's concerns. Read 17. The site agent also clarified that the information about a possible drone attack threat was relayed to her in 2023.318. The USSS intelligence advance agent also did not receive information about a threat in advance of the July 13th rally. The USSS intelligence advance agent told the committee he did not know why counter snipers were being sent and he did not receive any intelligence on threats related to the July 13th rally, nor about the arrest of Mr. Merchant on July 12th, the day before the rally. On July 10, 2024, the intelligence advance agent sent a letter to FBI requesting any intelligence related to former President Trump and the July 13 rally in Butler, Pennsylvania. The FBI did not respond to this intelligence request, a document from the USSS Protective Intelligence and Assessment Division dated July 8 described open source findings for candidate Donald Trump's visit to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. According to interviews the committee conducted with the USSS intelligence advance agent for the Butler rally, having received no intelligence from headquarters. The intelligence advance agent called the USSS Protective Intelligence Division, asked if there were any updates, and was told there were not. The site agent explained to the committee, Normally, we receive a bulletin with any information or any advisory information in regards to a specific visit, but not for this one referring to the July 13th rally. Noting, it came back with negative results, as no threats or no other issues or concerns prior to the visit. 324. The site agent counterpart explained that she was never made aware there was any type of threat to former President Trump in advance of the rally. Without being briefed on any specific intelligence threats, the site counterpart assumed USSS sent counter snipers because of the size of the rally and venue. In notes taken after the assassination attempt, the site counterpart wrote, Why am I hearing that there were threats to the site on TV? 
How can the SAAC of Oin Field Office not know about any threats, and why did they feel that only one part of Special Operations Divisions was sufficient to cover it, instead of the entire package? The USSS site counterpart explained that by entire package she meant not sending counter-assault team liaisons CSU and other assets. 3 and 28. F. Excerpt of site agent counterpart notes, taken after the July 13th rally. Threats. Why am I hearing, hearing that to the site on TV? There were threats, threats to. How can the, know about, say ik of cur of cur fo not any threats, and, why did they feel that only our part of sod was sufficient to caves it instead of the entire package? 7. Counter unmanned aircraft system failures. At 3.51 p.m. on July 13, 2024, Crooks flew a drone near the site of the Butler rally for about 11 minutes. 330. USSS Acting Director Ronald Rowe testified at a Senate hearing that on July 13, the USSS Counter Unmanned Aerial Systems CUACs had technical difficulties and did not go operational until after 5. 000, and that had it been working properly, WE could have maybe stopped him Crooks. The committee learned that in addition to the CUACs technical difficulties, Requests for additional CUAS equipment and longer drone flight restrictions were denied. Further, the USSS agent tasked with CUAS responsibilities at the rally had very little experience with the equipment he was operating. Requests for additional counter-drone equipment and drone flight restrictions were denied. USSS TSD's outdoor site survey of threats and vulnerabilities flagged that the open farm area rally site is vulnerable to possible drone attacks with a limited amount of CUAS equipment on site as well as vehicle-borne improvised explosive devices, both of which are items the shooter brought near the rally site undetected. Re-34. The site agent told the committee that she was briefed on possible drone attacks in June 2023, but did not receive any briefings prior to the July 13th rally. USSS used CUAS equipment intended to counter the unauthorized use of drones the day of the rally. USSS has several forms of drone mitigation equipment available. An additional mitigation tool for protective events is a temporary flight restriction TFR, issued by the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, which bans all unauthorized aircrafts, including drones, from operating in a certain area for a limited period of time. 338. USSS assigned the CUAS advance agent to operate the CCUAS unit the day of the Butler Farm Show rally. USSS also assigned other equipment that can assist in mitigation efforts. 340. On July 10, during a phone call with the USSS lead technician for the event as part of pre-planning for the security of the rally, the CCUA's advance agent requested an additional mitigation capability as well as a more advanced mitigation system with a technician to operate it as a backup to the CUS system. Both requests were denied. On July 12, the day before the rally, the CUA's advance agent visited the Butler Farm Show to determine the best location to place the CCUAS U1D 343. He initially placed it a few hundred yards from the stage. During this site visit, the CUES advance agent spoke to another USSS agent in person to request extending the time for the TFR for the event. 3 and 45. Specifically, the CUES advance agent was concerned that former President Trump sometimes operates outside of the expected time frame for his events. And a longer TFR would provide more certainty that the TFR would cover the entire time former President Trump was on the stage. The request for extending the TFR was denied without explanation. FAA approved the TFR at the Butler Farm Show rally site from 4.20 p.m. to 6.15 p.m. on July 13, 348. The USSS official responsible for overseeing CUAs at the J-July 13 rally lacked experience and knowledge about the equipment. In an interview with the committee, the USSS CUAS advance agent said that, following a 10-0 AM post standard briefing at the rally site on J-July 13, he tried to activate the CUAS equipment that can detect drones and immediately began having issues with it. Because the equipment was located near satellite trucks, he decided to change locations for the CUAs to avoid potential interference. However, even after he moved the equipment to a different location and reconnected everything, it was still inactive. The CUA's advance agent determined that the equipment was not active, and at approximately 11.30 a.m., he began to call others within the USSS asking for help. 352. He contacted a member of his detail and also spoke to the USSS official he believed was in charge of the CCUAS Program 353. In his interview with the committee, the CUA's advance agent said this official gave him the number for tech support at the company that produces the CUAS equipment. The CUA's advance agent was unable to reach someone immediately when he called the tech support hotline. He also undertook basic steps to troubleshoot the problem, such as reconnecting wires and moving the location of the equipment. When the CUAS unit's tech support called the CCUAS advance agent back, he worked with them for several hours over several phone calls. 
where they took steps to fix the problem such as restarting the system remotely and pushing software updates to the system, to no avail. 357. Shortly after 4.00 p.m., the CUES advance agent received a call from the CCUES unit's tech support, who told him that the components of the system were not communicating with each other. A re 50 they recommended he replace an Ethernet cable between two components of the equipment. He did not see an Ethernet cable in the security room, so he approached the audiovisual personnel for the Trump campaign and used one of their Ethernet cables. Shortly afterwards, the system became operational, and at 4.33 p.m., he called the second supervisor for the Trump detail to let him know the system was active. 361. Once the system was operational, the only drones the CUA's advance agent detected were drones operated by local police. With no backup CUA system while the CCUA's Unite was down, USSS did not have any drone detection capabilities. When the committee asked the CUA's advance agent if he had received specialized training in the use of the CCUA's unit, which consists of two boxes and four antenna nodes, he replied that another USSS employee walked him through the CUA's units. 353 Transcribed Interview with U.S. Secret Service CUA's Advance Agent at 20 August 20, 2024 354 Transcribed Interview with U.S. Secret Service CUA's Advance Agent at 20 August 20, 2024 355 Transcribed Interview with U.S. Secret Service CUA's Advance Agent at 121 August 20, 2024 356 Transcribed Interview with U.S. Secret Service CUA's Advance Agent at 16, 18, August 20, 2024. 357 Transcribed Interview with U.S. Secret Service CUAS Advance Agent at 20 August 20, 2024. 358 Transcribed Interview with U.S. Secret Service CUA's Advance Agent at 20 to 21, August 20, 2024. 359 Transcribed Interview with U.S. Secret Service CCUAS Advance Agent at 21 August 20, 2024. The committee notes that this recounting of events contrasts with acting director Rowe's testimony before the committee that the inoperability of the CUA system came from cellular connectivity issue. See Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs and Senate Committee on the Judiciary, testimony of U.S. P Secret Service acting director Ronald Rowe, examination of the security failures leading to the assassination attempt on former President Trump, 118th Kong, July 30, 2024. S.H.R.G. 118XX. 360 Transcribed Interview with U.S. Secret Service CUAS Advance Agent at 21 August. 20. 2024. The CUAS Advance Agent noted that it is not common to use equipment that is not USSS property, but given the delay in troubleshooting the device he stated, I just wanted to get the system up. 361 Transcribed Interview with U.S. Secret Service CUAS Advance Agent at 21 August 20, 2024. 362 Transcribed Interview with U.S. Secret Service CUAS Advance Agent at 33, 42-43, August 20, 2024. 363 Transcribed Interview with U.S. Secret Service CUAS Advance Agent at 27, August 20, 2024.